last session, two weeks ago, we talked about pretty much shop made chucks with showing you how a glue block could hold a bowl on a lathe. And I have taught hundreds of people to turn in classes and so on and so forth. And uh, I would, for years resisted metal chucks because in the early days they were very expensive, horrifically so. And secondly, chucks, metal commercial chucks are held out as this panacea that's gonna solve all your holding problems and you can just go forwards and be happy. And that really isn't true. Uh, they'll, a good metal chuck will do some tremendous things, but if you can't use those glue blocks and get the fits and all that necessary for the glue blocks, you're never going to be successful with a metal chuck. Just, in fact, when I'm finally, the people at Nova con convinced me to go to the teaching of metal chucks because they were becoming so widely available and adopted that you sort of had to go with the flow. Uh, we actually, after that, we get more bowls flying off lathes than we ever did with glue blocks. So I would like today to, after showing you how that one from two weeks ago, how we could glue a bowl very handily right on a faceplate and turn it very securely, I'd like to show you how we properly mount a bowl on a scroll chuck. And we really will look briefly at the history of scroll chucks. Uh, and starting in the late 1980s, uh, people started taking engineering chucks. These are metal working chucks. This is a big, heavy chuck. It weighs about 10 pounds. And Vic, uh, the company in England, was the first one to start peddling these are Polish chucks. They were made in, in the Eastern zone in those days. And they were very reasonably priced and very well made compared to uh, chucks made by Rhone in Germany or all of your US chuck makers. The problem with these chucks with most of them are three jaws for engineering lathes because most often in an engineering lathe, you're grabbing either a round bar or a hex bar. And hex bars, of course, become uh, a bowl because of the six sides. Well, they do make four jaw ones and they're very handy because once in a while you work on square stock. But uh, the jaws are very narrow at their inner surface. And so they tended just to dent the living bejesus out of a piece of wood and not really center it very well or hold it exceptionally well. But again, there was the fact that you could just tighten this thing quickly and grab something and go with it. And that's appealing to people. It really is. It's sort of like so much. I'll put this over here. And I'm going to switch cameras now. So there you can see a pile of chucks on the bed of my one way here. And this was the original chuck that Nova innovated. Uh, somewhere around 1985 uh, and they, it was what you call a lever chuck in that you stuck two levers in these two holes and you turn these two parts and that would open and shut the jaws. And it's actually a pen and ink drawing that I did of this chuck that was in the email uh, uh, notification of this meeting. But uh, there is what's called a scroll plate in any of these uh, 
chucks. And a scroll plate is simply a expanding spiral that comes out to the edge of a plate. And it's really a screw thread made flat. And there are racks on the other underside of the bottom jaws here that engage that scroll. And by turning this, it runs them in and out. And Nova sold this in 1985 for about 175 or 80 dollars, when all the Polish chucks were going for quite a bit more than that. And this is one of the first four or five to come in the country. And I've often used it for checking the speed of things because I have a piece of reflective tape on it that I can measure the speed with a tachometer. One problem with lever chucks is it's only so much torque you can get on those two levers. And so most of the manufacturers quickly, including Nova, went over to gear driven chucks. This is their gear driven chuck. It, it drives right here with a hex key. And Nova chucks do work backwards. The scroll of Nova chucks is the reverse direction of all other chucks in the world. And so they can be a little niggling until you get used to it. You, I have enough different chucks that I seldom use the Novas anymore because everything else runs the other way and I'm used to that. And all my metal working was with right hand scrolls too. The reason for them reversing the scroll, scroll direction is that with metalworking chucks, there's no safety in them. If you wind the jaws all the way, you can just slowly pull these jaws out of the chuck one jaw at a time. So if you open one of these too far and you start the lathe, one of these jaws can go ballistic and it can literally kill you. Uh, it's a fairly common industrial accident. So Nova immediately realized this problem and uh, put an additional safety, but their, their reasons for the reverse scroll is if this chuck is idling on your lathe with nothing on it, the inertia of the scroll now closes the jaws where in the, all the rest of these chucks, it opens the jaws. So they thought this would make it a lot safer and I, I think it does. But they also added a little port right here, a cross drilled hole in the number four jaw, which is the first to exit the chuck that limits the travel of these outwards. You put a little set screw down in there and that limits the travel. And so the chuck is safety. All the other manufacturers since then have put some kind of safety in their chuck. Uh, Nova now does it underneath here. You just can't get the uh, jaws out of the chuck without removing the scroll plate. So it, it's, it's really a very safe chuck from that direction. Uh, one way does it on the bottom of the number four jaw is a little pin that goes into keyways in the face of the chuck. And there's two different keyways, one longer than the other. On the shorter keyway, the jaws will not extend outside the body of the chuck. And on the, uh, sec the longer keyway, they'll come out a little beyond the body, but not to an unsafe distance. If, you're got, if you have beginners or children using the lathe, using the shorter keyway is a, is a good idea because to the uninitiated, you can get hurt somewhat by one of the corners of these jaws catching you in some way. That's I, the chuck I just showed you is one way's big stronghold chuck. This is their a smaller talon chuck, which is a lovely little chuck. And uh, I would say the, the, the third maker of, of 
good checks. There's three makers. There's Nova, One Way, and Vicmark. Uh, Vicmark and Nova, I'd say, are in sort of uh, even running for the best chuck there is in woodworking. Uh, the Vicmark only builds rather large chucks for heavy lathes, but right here you could see a roll pin in the number four keyway of this chuck that makes this safety, then you can't get the jaws out until you take the back off and drive that roll pin out. Now, a pretty common feature of all these chucks, get rid of these two one-way keys, and get out the uh, Vicmark key, is that you can put what is essentially a bolt in here with a thread on it, and this makes this into a screw chuck. Now, yesterday afternoon, when I cut a piece of sassafras from a little log I have sitting outside, and I bandsawed it round after I laid out a circle on the piece that I cut out of this log. There you can see the bark. This is the outside of the tree. And I took a bit brace and went on that center mark and drilled a little hole in there. And I can now simply put this right here and wind this right down onto this screw. I'll lock my spindle for a second. There. I have a good solid hold. And the advantage of using a screw chuck for your initial hold is that you get perfect centering of your layout. I can look at this scribed line here and it's pretty well running perfectly. And I have that piece now held and I can commence work. Now you tend to get the strongest bowl by making the outside of the tree the outside of the bowl. In other words, the base of the bowl is right here where the bark would have been out right out about here. And of course, this adds to the shape of the bowl that this is bark inclusion here yet, and that'll be turned away as I turn this into a half hemisphere. For the beginner, it is a good idea to make a couple of calculations. One, and this is one of my second harangues against commercial chucks, is you are limited to the size of the jaws for the base of your bowl. So that's why if you have a small lathe, it's better to buy a smaller chuck because it's gonna fit into the base of most bowls better for you. Uh, for this whopping chuck I've got on here, it really, is only good for holding a bowl that is quite a bit bigger. But I'll show you how that works in a minute or we'll switch to another chuck, it doesn't matter. But you wanna make the base about a third the diameter of the bowl or a bit less. And if we measure this blank, we've got about an eight and a half inch diameter blank here and uh, so we want to make that like a two and three quarter inch base, which, you know, puts you down about that big. And again, a beginner's mistake is to make the base out here somewhere, and it tends to make a bowl that's unattractive and kind of clunky. So... I'm going to uh, cancel mute here and uh, uh, ask if there's any questions to this point. Maybe 
maybe I did not unmute you. We can all unmute ourselves too, I think. Oh, all right. Uh, so, anybody curious. has a question, just unmute yourself and- yeah. Ernie, I, I got a simple one. Uh, the hole you drilled for that, uh, uh, you know, for the uh, holding uh, screw, the whatever we call the screw, uh, what, what's, how, how big or how small was that hole compared to the diameter of the screw? In other words, I don't want, I don't want one of those things com coming loose on me. No, and that's uh, an, an important factor. Um, let me get a pencil here. I'll be right back. If you take a thread like this, under old terminology that I was taught when I learned machining, you have the, you have the crest diameters, which are the diameters across the crests of the threads on both sides. And you have the root diameter, which would be the diameter along the bottom of the Vs of the threads. So this would be the root diameter, this would be the crest diameter, that's been replaced, and it was replaced about like 1975 with minor diameter uh, and major diameter. But you generally want to make that thread, that hole just above that root diameter. If you go below the root diameter, you'll be actually splitting the wood as you drill down, as you run that screw in there and you will actually lose holding strength. So the optimally you want to be just above that root diameter, a little bit larger than that. So you're getting about 70, 80% of the thread holding. And the larger you get, the worse it gets. And also, you've got to adjust those figures a little bit for harder, physically harder woods and physically softer woods. To drill the hole, I use a common bit brace, which is there. So how are you powered up? It works great. How, how are you measuring the root diameter? Like just by. Uh, you can actually get in there with a pair of calipers pretty easily. Um, also, you may find that there's a suggested hole size with uh, for the chuck. Uh, right there, you see a pair of calipers gets in there to the root pretty well. So I'm reading a root diameter of about uh, 375, 3 eighths on this would be about right. What, what, what do you, what, what don't you like about the one way that's inferior to the Nova or Vicmar? I actually, I'd say one way is my favorite chuck. Oh. Uh, I've used them more in my lifetime. The Vicmar is very heavily built and is a very nice chuck, but again, it's only for pretty large work. Uh, they're, they make one smaller than this. It's also uh, more expensive, but one ways chuck also, I think, may be superior in that in all of the other chucks, the adapter, and they all work this way, there's an adapter at the back of this chuck that screws in and fits it to your lathe spindle. So this allows you, if, with any of these chucks, if you buy a new lathe with a different size spindle, you just buy a new adapter for it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy a whole new chuck. One ways goes in on a, on a machine taper from the back. It's actually a tapered piece and it's held in with three set screws right here. To take this out of there, you have to remove these three set screws 
then screw them into here and alternately tighten them a little bit and it'll pull that taper apart. It's a locking taper. And a locking taper is more accurate than a machine thread for centering something. So I think that is a very cool piece of design in this chuck. All the chucks also have a threaded cross hole and most of your lathe spindles have a notch or area with a depression in it around just ahead of the shoulder of the spindle and that screw can go in there so it can't come on and screwed if you run the lathe in a reverse. That's an important feature. And if you plan to run in reverse, you should tighten that screw. Any other questions? All these chucks also need to every so often be torn down to pieces and usually mine have finish all over them. Uh, they're to the point where they don't even work really smoothly. And I just throw all the metal parts in a bucket of lacquer thinner and let them sit for a day or so. And, and that then wire brush them all by hand and or with a brass wire brush and get all that stuff off of them and put them all the, back together with a little uh, dry slide in them for lubrication and they will work like new. So let's look now at using a bowl gouge to make the initial shape of this bowl. bowl. And I think it's probably even with a chuck, not a bad idea for a beginner to just stick a tailstock against that because you've taken all the axial load off that screw and really this can't fly off of there now. The only thing you can do is strip the screw out, which means that you would have to go to a glue block or uh, glue a dowel in the hole, redrill it and start over again. Uh, there's a lot of solutions, but none of them are pretty. But the way to properly use a bowl gouge, and, and I might just add one other thing here. Uh, if you try to use a spindle gouge and you hold it down against this, twice the revolution, you'd just be digging right into that end grain. And um, it often will rip the piece off the face plate or uh, 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 break the gouge handle. Uh, I've seen a lot of weird accidents over the years. With a bowl gouge, we are actually going to cut parallel to the axis of rotation. And we're going to keep this little nose bevel right here rubbing on our cut. And we're really going to guide the cut by twisting the tool to, to uh, maintain the quality or achieve the quality of the cut. And we're going to direct the cut by swinging it on the rest. It's always going to remain fairly level on the rest. So we start it. I'm taking my left hand and just dragging that in in a straight cut, cut. It's the flute is pointed to about 9:30. There I now got a place where my nose bevel is rubbing. I will turn that until the cut goes sweet. And now by simply pushing on the handle, it will cut. Cut is becoming increasingly interrupted as I go along here. I almost always keep my pinky in the chip screen, and this keeps me from getting hit in the face by the chips. There, I brought the speed up a little. I'm going to flare that now. And you see we have a nice smooth cut there because it's a sharp tool. 
we got a little bit of bark left to take off. We probably could set the base diameter now. I'm going to set it at about something like that. And I'll probably go under that diameter in the long run. I'm going to pull the tailstock, get it out of the way. I'm also going to take the live center out of it so I don't back into it and surprise myself. getting a little bump often starts to set in and almost always raising the handle and getting the tool more level on the rest will make that go away. But if everything's happening one finger on the tool, all the control is in the right hand. I'm swinging it, flaring out. A beginner's mistake is to try to drag this tool with your left hand. And really, if you can't control it with your right, you will never control it. Once you achieve that ability, then you can start doing this too. I often will control the cut with both hands in some kind of weird situation. Another nice accoutrement This is a rest made by Robust and not by one way, but is a curved tool rest like this. And just incidentally, your tool rest wants to be such that the center of the tool is on the center of the piece when held reasonably level on the rest. That's about the right height. Make sure they're locked. But this is awfully nice because it can help you to just drive right around this corner without much problem. I'm gonna get a little bit closer here. Now this is an important, uh, I guess, series of cuts here is the starting at what you call the foot of the bowl right here, the bottom. You need to come in and go sort of that direction and then pivot like that. And then swing the handle around towards yourself to create an S curve down in there. And that's that very familiar shape we connect with a well-formed bowl. And I'm coming up that wall, and I'm gonna now flare that bowl. And there is your classic Paul Revere shape of a hero of the American Revolution was actually a heck of a good silversmith too. <laughs> Dust. It's not COVID, I hope. <laughs> uh, so there, there's basically our outside of our bowl. There are some things we can do to improve that finish, and I'll show you those right now. 
this is what I call the trick cut, and it works excellent on the outside, but. We lost video, Ernie. Uh, all right, thank you. It's 50, every 15 minutes, it, I think, or every 10 minutes, it times out. There we go. I've raised my rest, and this is what I call the trick cut, but I'm going to set this tool way up like this on its side, and I'm going to rub this bevel on the... Uh, on the surface and roll it until the edge cuts. And I'm gonna make a little cut right across there and it will leave a finish that will save you days, if not hours of sanding. I'm going to also zoom in a little on that so you can see it a little better. All right. But I'm going to start there right like that and just bring that. And I think you can see the difference in the finish, especially in this area where we're going against the grain, is better here now than it is there. I'd like to do it with a really sharp, freshly sharpened gouge. I'm just going to switch gouges here. And you can come right up through here like this, too. Now, watching me do it with this gouge, it can also be done with a spindle gouge. But the trick of using it is to put the gouge this way and, and work really sideways. like this, and this is the way I generally do it, to be honest. And you can see by the shavings I'm getting that I'm taking a very nice sheer cut. And that will just save you an awful lot of time to perfect that of not having to sand all this tear out. On your plank grain right in here, it won't make much difference. And a scraper would not be effective or it would be dangerous? A, a scraper will never improve a finish. Um, it, you can shear scrape and get some. It's slow work. Uh, there's nothing like a cutting tool. Um, mm. Scrapers are always sort of a last ditch tool in my mind, but a necessary one at times. So if we take and find out the diameter of these jaws, we'll find that they're probably too big to make a decent base on this bowl. I'm going to simply take this set of dividers and open it up to what I need to be able to check this bowl. And you can see that I'm quite a bit above the diameter of my base here. So this I did this kind of purposely to speak to the idea of 
you want to think about the size of the chuck you buy pretty carefully for your first chuck. So you generally open the jaws up to where they better come around to where you can see everything again. I think that's a pretty good piece of real estate right there. Ernie, you've got a white square on the screen, which has been covering up where you've been cutting. Yeah, I can get rid of that. Sorry about that. That's a, you just bring up that to tell where you're focusing pretty important. So I've opened this till it's a perfect circle. And if you get outside of a perfect circle that those jaws make, they tend to only hold in the middle. And if you're inside that, they only hold at the outer edges of the jaw. So you get the most holding out of this diameter. And I'm setting the dia the dividers to that diameter. And I'll simply put them in and find the center right here. And then scrape a nice little hole in there. Ernie, can you explain why with that chuck you're talking about a perfect circle and not a perfect circle? Wouldn't you expect that to remain a perfect circle as you expand the chuck? No, it doesn't, unfortunately. You see, as you get that larger, these are not forming a perfect circle. You're only going to touch at the center of these. You have quite a bit of range where it doesn't make much difference. And even there's some things you could hold out like this, but it's also unwise to do it at this one because you only touch on, this is actually worse because you only touch on these outer corners. About there is where you want to be. You'll see it very Definitely, if you look down on the chuck. I'm going to take this bowl gouge now and just hollow this out a little bit. And now I'm going to raise my rest to scrape. Probably help a little. And I've got a scraper here, which is just a half inch scraper that was a round nose originally, but I ground it into a V shape. And I've ground that V to less than 90 degrees. So I put, or I'm sorry, I've ground this to exactly 90 degrees so that I put a straight wall mortise in here. And that's the kind of mortise a one way chuck like. There, I've just touched my line. And I'm going to just break that corner. But if you see, I have a perfect recess in here. And there's a couple of things that's important. It's important that this be a level fairly flat surface down in here because the faces of those jaws touch that and that's what brings this straight on the chuck and then these can expand into that surface right there and that's what holds it on the chuck so let me get my here. Ernie, they also sell these dovetail jaws, right? I mean, yeah, well, it's it, uh, one way has their own patented system, which has this double little shoulders, I guess you'd call them, on the tips of the jaws, and they really do hold quite well. Um, I like the system. 
but everybody else uses a dovetail shape. Um, either system works fine. If it's a dovetail shape, you would grind this scraper to less than 90 degrees so that you got enough dihedral in that wall uh, that that jaw is going to expand in that dovetail, and that's what keeps it from coming off the chuck. So are they thought to be safer or have greater holding power, a dovetail? Uh, I don't find any difference between the two. Both systems okay. seem to work quite well. Uh, this one was the brainchild of uh, Tim Clay, who is uh, a Dutch engineer uh, and a very good one. Uh, so, Ernie, you're holding this this on this chuck by the outside diameter of the chuck and unscrewing it to make it wider to fit in that that mortise that you've turned. Exactly. Why would you do Why would you do that and not make a, a like a tenon and grab it from the outside? I have found in bowl turning, and that, and that uh, most people use a tenon, but you take a tenon of that diameter, you don't have very much cross strength in it. And I, I, I've i seen students break them off almost every time they catch, they break it off. An experienced okay. turner, it probably doesn't matter, but as long as you leave enough hoop strength around this base here, for that thing to expand in there, I feel it's a much stronger hold. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, that's subject to interpretation, but that's that's my take on it. Gonna, Ernie, I, uh, I, I'd like to I just make the comment. Uh, uh, I've recently gone to the uh, Nova with a dovetail approach, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Nova makes a uh, a dandy little uh, uh, dovetail chisel, if you will, I've forgotten the proper name for it, to cut those dovetails. And uh, it, works, it works just fine. The, the only real problem I have, or not problem so much as uh, a uh, criticism is that the dovetail joint is deeper. So when you get done with your bowl, you've got a uh, relatively significant uh, indent in the base there where that dovetail uh, recess uh, was. Well, uh, it's seldom uh, necessary to go very deep with a dovetail. Uh, and again, this most beginners try to make the dovetail a lot deeper than they need to. Generally, an eighth of an inch is all you need for a depth on a dovetail. If, if you looked at this one, that's all the deeper I am on this one. And a, as little as a sixteenth will work sometimes. And you got to remember, as you go to bigger sets of jaws and your circle gets better, you actually get more holding area out of the chuck than you do with a small one. So uh, it's a somewhat self compensating system. There. I'm at the right place. Whoops. Unlock my spin bolt be better. Now to make an internal cut, you really need to come around like this and the handle has to be all the way pointing at the camera actually, which it's, uh, yeah, it's not 90 degrees to the lathe, but it's probably 45 degrees to the lathe to start with here. And I'm gonna start there with a little cut. There we go. And I'm just gonna come right around like that. And now instead of pointing at nine o'clock, it's pointing at about three o'clock, the flute. I make a scrape cut until I get a little bit of a shoulder to rest on. Then I turn that slowly until I find the sweet cut. And then I just come right around like that.
And you see, height becomes very important here. If it isn't cutting, generally raising the handle and getting that edge right on the center line of the lathe is going to make that cut properly. And there I've come to the center. My rest could be just a trifle lower. Rest height's pretty critical on this cut. That's nice. And you can do this with one hand if everything's right. Now something that'll help a beginner too is to make a facing cut across here and just come out from right here and just run that chisel. I just threw chips all over my computer keyboard. Oh joy. <laughs> One thing you want to really do is you've got a very, very sharp edge there. It's the same as a Hobart meat slicer. And you mm -hmm. want to come in here with the dead side whiz on the gouge and just scrape that until it's got a chamfer on it and it's not going to cut you. See how much easier the start was? See how I'm rotating that gouge slowly counterclockwise as I come to the center. From the gouge's point of view, as that tenon gets smaller in there, the cut has to be more and more vertical to keep this rubbing on the tenon. So you really get to where it's almost level, not quite. I took a pretty heavy cut there, pretty much the whole width of the cutting surface. I'm going to pick that up. Now. now it's time to start thinking about thickness. For a small bowl like this, you can actually just reach in with your hand and, and do this. You want to be careful of not having chips in there. It'll catch your thumb and whack it on the wrist, but all things in an open form like this is pretty safe. You have the ability to jar, judge within about 5% of thickness um, with your hands. You can judge about one part in 30. So I'm expanding the diameter a little bit without going too much deeper. Now, something I personally think is important Let me get my pencil. It's over here. Need the pad. As you start cutting this bowl, we've got it somewhat like this at the moment. And we've cut to a point about like this right now. A lot of people try to just cut down as a cone like this and they end up with this and trying to get all this material out of this area. I feel it's better to make a whole series of cuts that mimic the shape of the bowl as long as you can because I think it makes you visualize and as you get into closed forms it makes you able to control wall thickness better. But at some point, you start having to step this wall like you would mine out a quarry like that. 
and you finalize this wall right in here, and then you step it down like that, and you finalize this, and then you step it, and then you come down, step it, and finally just finish the whole thing off. It generally will start to get a little bit thicker in this area, and you certainly need more area in here because you, you're gonna end up with something like that to take out your chucking recess. I also, on the foot of the bowl, I think is very important because it lifts the bowl from the table and separates it from the surface it's sitting on. And again, when you turn this over, it should look like a piece of china. Barney, the, Barney we have no camera. Ah, sorry about that. Pesky camera. The foot of that bowl is very important because it separates it from the table. And again, it can be quite small compared, it can be a lot less than a third because any, almost anything you put in the bowl is going to level itself in the bowl and all the forces go in this direction and it tends to be stable. So the diameter of the base isn't, is, is exaggerated by most beginners. It's a big beginner's mistake. But if you, if you learn to draw, you, you do some things to create effect. And if you're drawing a cube, say, you could make this seem like this was a surface by putting a shadow here. And we've now got a sense that the light would be up here somewhere. But you can also come in and darken these lines and that creates what's called a proximity shot shadow in drawing and gives you this sense of the connection to be sitting on a surface. So in the bowl, I, when I finalize this, I will put a chamfer right here and right here, which creates a shadow line around that foot. And uh, at the right level, when you're looking at it, it will help a little to distinguish that from the table and I think gives it a little bit of a better look. Again, yeah, I'm fairly even on wall thickness at the, this point. Um, there are a bunch of ways to check wall thickness if you have a, a deeper bowl. I have a fancy gizmo that costs 75 or 80 bucks around here somewhere, but I can't find it at the moment. But um, a very simple way is you can, on a bowl this size, simply take a pair of calipers like this, and by running them down like that, I can see it. I'm, I'm actually pretty thick down here in the bottom where I'm thinner up here. You can also just take a piece of eighth inch welding rod and bend it around into kind of a circle and take the two ends at right angle like that and just bend that all the time till you can check the wall thickness. And you can make that for the price of a stick of welding rod, which is probably somebody at a welding shop would give you a stick. All right. I'm getting thicker right starting there. So I'm gonna bring that 
wall out. Still pretty heavy right down in here. Nice. This is the point where gouges begin to fail you and going to a big scraper can be quite beneficial. There it is. And you can, you need to raise the rest always to scrape. Also, the beginner putting the rest a little inside the bowl, especially the larger ones, so that it was sticking over like this or getting an inside curve rest can be very useful. But I've got this downhill now, and I can just drag right across there like that. And I'm coming onto the wall now. I'm going to tip that scraper like that and just bring it right out like that. Little bit of wonkiness in the wall right there. Rest can be done with sandpaper. So that is pretty much the process of turning a, a functional uh, bowl of even height. Uh, you can now go to closed forms or you can go to uh, uh, natural edges. One trick for a natural edge is to take that same little scraper we have right here and you've got an uneven height there so it's going to be very hard to stop start that that bowl gouge so you start here and you scrape through all the unevenness so you get down to about here about like that. Bring the rest down to the right height Get it inside your hollow form, and you've got to stop the lathe when you, you move rests with hollow form. With uh, I'm sorry, natural edges. So I can now pick that right up and go on. So as you get into natural edges, the scraper becomes a pretty good friend to start that cut. Uh, after you get a fair amount of experience with a really sharp gouge, almost anybody can go through a natural edge with a gouge, but um, occasionally you get one which has a really high peak here somewhere where the scraper going through it with the scraper is the only way that it will happen. Questions? Yeah, Ernie, you, you said that's a nine inch blank that you started with, you know, is there a point where you would no longer trust the threaded screw to hold uh, a bigger blank? I mean, where's the limit or you might switch to needing a faceplate to mount the blank. That's a, a good question. Uh, I actually have turned bowls as big as this lathe will handle, uh, and it'll handle uh, uh, a 24 inch diameter uh, with no problem. But I do go to a very heavy screw. Uh, uh, w w one way makes a still, heavier screw that is bigger than the one I used initially. Uh, these are both the heavy screws. Um,
I was holding this bolt with this lighter screw and you can see that this one is less diameter than these. And these have a, a really a special thread that's milled in there and it has very straight walls. They have a lot of holding power. And if you pin it with a tailstock until you get it round and, and get it shaped up so that you don't have any big corners or lumps or hard spots sticking out there, um, this is a pretty safe hold. The only thing you can do is strip the thread, uh, but it won't really come off there because the tailstock's pinning it on the, on the screw. But hey, Bernie, you didn't use that stepping approach. Is, is that not necessary? The one that you drew on the paper? Yeah, that's what I did here. I, I okay. stepped that down, as you notice. I worked around there. I kept going down this wall and stepping it. On a bowl this size, I'm only stepping it about an eighth of an inch. So mm, okay. uh, on bigger bowls, you might work differently. Uh, it seems everybody wants to turn a really big bowl. Uh, as they get into wood turning and, and want to try bowl turning. And the anything out to about 12 or even 14 inches is pretty doable for anybody. But as you start to go bigger than that, it gets to be a lot of factors and it gets a lot more dangerous. Uh, so, uh, and a bowl above 14 inches isn't terribly useful. Uh, you can't, the, the fruit will rot in them before you can use it. And they take up a lot of real estate in the house. So how many of those can you have sitting around? And uh, they tend to languish. Uh, we have a couple of that size around and about the only time we use them is for the annual clam bake to throw shells in. <laughs> mm -hmm. hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, Ernie, I have a question. In my backyard, I have a cherry tree that's about about 18 inches at the bottom of the trunk and it blew down about a year ago. Uh, some of the branches weren't in good shape. And I've, I've attacked it with a bandsaw and cut some sections off. And I actually tried your silica gel technique, but uh, I left annular rings in it and the wood all split. But I've, I've sealed the ends of that tree and I've, I've, today I'm gonna pick up my new bandsaw Am I wasting my time trying to make a bowl out of a tree that's been felled and lying on its side for a year, even though the ends have been sealed? Is it going to crack on me? Uh, yeah. This basically was a little sassafras, piece of a sassafras log that I uh, cut yesterday with a chainsaw. I bucked it and then I stuck it on a bandsaw and I ripped two planks out of it. You can see here's the outside of the mating piece and here's the center of the tree. I took the little bit thicker piece that didn't have any complete annular rings in it. Uh, but uh, you can work with that quite nicely. But again, you wanna try to eliminate this pith center area from each half. And uh, I do it by just taking the round piece after I buck it off with a chainsaw with square cuts on each end. I just set it on the bandsaw table and cut through there. Uh, there's a video on Woodworker's Journal site that I made uh, about a year ago or a little more than a year ago uh, of, of how to use a bandsaw to cut this kind of stuff and the steps in it. And I used a piece of black ash that had fallen on my property line and, and it was there in the spring and I cut it up and. I, took that and it had had poison ivy all over it the previous year. And I bandsawed all that bark and everything. And I had poison ivy for the next month, all up and down both arms. It was a terrible experience. So <laughs> be careful of that one. <laughs> well, well, I don't have poison ivy. The tree's just lying there. Yeah. Well, it it's in the cherry. That's what King Heipel and I always called pie cherry. It's not black cherry like we use in cabinet making. It's a, 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 it was probably a cherry that produced sweet cherries or bitter cherries, didn't it? I don't know. I, I don't know. We haven't been in the house 11 years, so I don't know how, what, was, what the tree did. It never bore fruit while we were living here. Yeah, well, it might be a black cherry. Black cherry will have 
a bark that looks like burnt cornflakes. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Thank you. And and pie cherry has just kind of a smooth bark that has little oh, fleck marks in it. Uh, to turn this bowl around and get rid of the chucking recess, there's a bunch of ways we can do it. One is with a vacuum chuck, which is a very easy way to do it. And we probably ought to have a session one of these days on chucking, but um, here's three commercial vacuum chucks that work just fine. Uh, and they have gotten to where they're reasonably priced. You can buy the hardware to get the vacuum through the spindle, um, a little Venturi unit that you hook to a nail gun compressor and it'll make the vacuum. And uh, these chucks range, it's about $75 for this chuck. Let me get that camera working again. And um, at any rate, the, these are, are a very nice system. Uh, and you can buy those uh, from any of the big woodworking supply houses, uh, craft supplies, um, Packard Woodworking carry them. And they're made by TMI, which is in the Carolinas. And it's uh, a very innovative, fellow that is also an airline pilot and he runs the business in his spare time. Uh, he's probably got a lot of spare time right now. Uh, the other way to do it, which we could probably demonstrate here. Oh, that's some days you get lucky. I'm going to uh, take the uh, so we're kind of gone, been going for a while. You guys all right time wise or shall we call it a day? All right. Okay. We're fine. Um, I'm not going to do a lot here. I'm just going to show this. So I've got that screw in there, and this is just a piece of shelving. You know, it's one by 12. And we can now put that bowl in there by scraping a chamfer opening. And you can see that this opening is chamfered from the last bowl that I held with this chuck. And I simply get out my armrest. Start that lathe up. And I'll scrape an opening to match that bowl in that way. And this is the way we turn the bottom side of bowls for years. And we would just, once we get that to the right diameter, we can just take this with our hand and whack that in there, put it around and uh, it'll come up nice and true. And you can then turn that out. Also the, Chuck makers make what I call rubber baby buggy bumper jaws that you can put little rubber feet on. They'll hold a bowl like this pretty good. Um, they won't hold a lot of, and of course, nothing will hold a natural edge. You have to go to what's called a nubbing chuck for that. But uh, for these, uh, they'll work fine, but they're pretty expensive and they don't work as good as this method does. By the time you change the jaws out in the chuck and get those bumpers at the right bolt circle, uh, I could have done it this way and gotten gone home and gotten drunk and gotten sober again while you completed the task. So uh, I, I think this is a very good method. 
And if you only want to turn a few dozen bolts, this, again, I don't think anything of doing that because it's the way I learned, but uh, the, uh, the vacuum chuck, if you do uh, a lot, is a really nice way to hold stuff like this. Uh, yep. Because you can just put it over the vacuum chuck and you put the vacuum on very lightly and then you just stick a round bar in here and the lever against the tool rest and you bring it right dead center and then you turn the vacuum to full vacuum. Other, so okay. that's about the presentation for today. Uh, it's time for your questions. Okay, Ernie, I got a, a question here on, on vacuum chucks. Um, if you take that uh, uh, face or whatever you, um, this, this thing you got mounted in the lathe right now, okay? Mm -hmm. And well, when you, any, any round uh, plate, it doesn't matter what it is. And if you had a hole bored through it and you put a, a face plate on the back side of it, and you may or may not uh, need a rubber gasket, I, I don't, that's, that's up to you. But why couldn't you just use a flat plate for vacuum at a low, low pressure. I don't think it's going to crack or cave. Uh, actually, uh, in several of my books, I give directions to make vacuum chucks. Uh, I, I make mine much like uh, this commercial chuck, wherever I set it right here. In that I will make a I'll take a face plate and mount a piece of MDF on it and then build up a circle out of pieces. I usually use six or eight sides so that you have, it's built like a, a, a pattern uh, that we used to make for iron and casting. And uh, you would build that up and then turn it smooth on the inside and outside and just uh, take a scraper and put a little round groove in the front of it, sometimes in several places. And then you just lay a piece of neoprene gasket material that you can buy from houses online by the foot. And you can glue it together with super glue. You don't want to use O-ring material, which is too hard. Uh, it doesn't have enough resilience for this kind of work. It has, uh, the, the hardness of rubber is measured in durometers. And uh, O-ring material has a hardness of about 80 durometers. And a vacuum O-ring material has a hardness of 30 to 40 durometers. But again, you can find it, I think, Packard and um, Craft Supplies and probably Woodcraft and Rockler sell it. So. Uh, it's readily available. Other questions? How do you get the bowl off that jam chuck that you, you just showed? How do you get it off once you finish? Oh, it's really easy. You just whack it like that and the chuck will flex enough that it just comes right <laughs> out in your hand. Okay. <laughs> it, it's not being held there by a lot of friction. Um, I've had bigger bowls where once I put it in here, I actually laid a piece of duct tape around each side just so that it wouldn't go flying off into the wild blue yonder if the chucking loose, loosened and got through fine that way. Okay. The other, if you're doing natural edges, you could just mount a big block of wood or even a jam chuck in your lathe and you can just simply put that bowl down over that nubbin or jam chuck. Uh, and it's just friction here. In fact, if you put a piece of cloth in here, you won't mar your bowl up as much if it's sanded out nice. And then you can hold it against there with a tailstock and a little block of wood. I think I showed that two weeks ago and, and turn this off that way. So there's a bunch of ways around to tackle all these problems. And the big thing I wanna get, a, a, across here is that this equipment will make things life simpler and faster to do all, all this, but uh, 
it won't make it any easier if you can't do it with these basic methods that don't really cost anything you're not going to do much better with the with the fancy equipment it's a skill set you need to, to use any of these methods okay well i appreciate all of you joining me here today and uh, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, any final questions here, I'm glad to, to uh, answer them. And uh, uh, this has gotten to be kind of a fun exercise. I'm enjoying this very much. And well, this is, this is very good of you to do it. I mean, we're still waiting for the class to open. And I guess that's still on the back burner. Yeah, I, I'm becoming a little more hopeful of that, that either we'll get herd immunity or we'll get uh, a vaccine by, I don't know, June maybe, I don't know. But, but it is a depressing state of affairs. It sure is, it sure is. Uh, Ernie, I'd like to make a radical comment for sure. bull trainers. And that is, uh, and I've just, it's just a thought process for me now, but I just turned a couple of uh, salad bowls, which uh, if we use them a lot, uh, presumably at some point they're gonna need to be refinished. Although I, I used uh, three or four coats of, um, what's the name, bowl finish. So I figured the finish will last a while. Mm. But why not just leave the recess that you cut in the bottom for your chuck there. Who looks at the bottom anyway? And the idea is if you leave the, the recess there, uh, 10 years from now, of course, I'll be in the box by then, but <laughs> if one of my kids wants to refinish the bowl, they can just throw it back on the lathe and, and, and go. You know, they can sand it and away they go. And uh, Anyway, that's my radical comment for the day. Well, uh, it is a, a bad idea, but one advantage to the vacuum chuck is that you can chuck up an existing bowl inside and outside on them and do things like that. Um, so that would be one way to do it without the uh, recess. And I guess the chucking recess would bother me every time I looked at it that I didn't do a finished <laughs> job on it. But, uh, Bruce uh, Dimmick, who asked this question, and I went to grade school and high school together, so we've known each other a long, long time. It took many camping trips together as kids. And, uh, yes, we did. Yeah, I was uh, always, uh, we lived in idyllic times, really. <laughs> yeah, we, we did. We really did. Uh, any other questions? Thank you very much, Ernie. It's wonderful information. It's always fun to watch it, no matter how, how many times you've done it. Thank you.